disruptors and curious minds. We are at it again. Welcome to another amazing episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson, builder, futurist, playing around at the intersection of technology, music, and story. My friend Mark Fielding, um, I'll let him do his uh, do his tagline. Hit us with it, Mark. <laughs> uh, well, I like yours. Very impressive. Um, I, I, I'm like a, a tagline chameleon um, this week. I am a technical writer, so I've been doing some technical writing this week, which is definitely the 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 weakest quiver in my writing. Um, no, the weak the weakest arrow in my writing quiver, whatever. It's it's my weakest point, um, and I think that's because, and, and you probably feel the same. Technical writing. So I've been exploring snarks and ZK proofs, and it's like just this giant mansion, and you walk into it and. There's so many rooms that you can go into that before long, you know, you're in the basement and you you don't know where the front door is and you're lost. And so there's so many interesting things that it's hard to to find out what to write about and what not to write about. Um, so you got to You got to almost get lost in it for a bit. And yes. then you, you find your way. Right. And technical writing to me is always trying to digest something. Uh, that is meant for a technical audience, but translate it to someone through the through the art of story and emotional connection to 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 generate that meaning. Um, yeah. And it's it's very difficult sometimes. You you could be swimming around in it, and you're just like, man, I'm I'm not going to hit anything. And all of a sudden, it's like, ooh, wait, there's the path, right? Yeah. I also and I also feel that if you get too technical, the people who want real technical, they're on GitHub, and the people. So, mate, I'm almost writing for so kind of you and me, it's people of our kind of knowledge perhaps or someone with a bit more uh, can you i have to leave my like the sarcasm and the poetry at the door though don't you when you're writing when you're technical hard, writing, man. you can't kind of you can't write whimsical poetry about snarks yeah it's like it's like trying to divide yourself into something smaller than a cork uh to 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 lose that uh to lose that sarcasm i don't think it's possible my friend it's what makes you you i think <laughs> i don't know well, uh, well, awesome. That's 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 great. What a cool thread to be jumping. How into about you? Week. What have you been working on this week? Um, this week, man. This week, I am uh, finalizing the last pass at a, a video series. I've turned my writing program, Right to Know You, into a digital experience that's going to live independently um, on some properties that I have, but also uh, at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, which I'm really excited about. Um, so we've been been working through the uh, the editing and post production process on that, but I'm, I've been pretty excited. That sounds awesome! Yeah, let us know well, when it's live. Will do. And speaking of exciting, uh, we're we're excited to continue to talk about our amazing partner Ripple with a W. Um, these guys have been uh, amazing in um, supporting our show, and 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 they're really aligned with kind of the work that we do as individuals. Um, Ripple is. Uh, marketing's on-demand talent talent platform, meaning if you're a brand and you're looking for people with amazing marketing superpowers, but you're not necessarily hiring full uh, full headcount, you get brought in uh, by a, you're a, a group of people who are pre-vetted can get brought in to your ecosystem, proven talent that you can apply to projects in really cool ways. And in the freelancer economy, and we called it last week, Mark, the solopreneur <laughs> world, really cool, right? solopreneur world um you know ripple now gives folks like mark and i and ps were on the platform uh should you need a builder futurist or technical writer um but it's a great way for for us solopreneurs and and freelancers to to get connected to major brands like delta equifax uh at t and a lot of the great work they're doing over there so dixie's usually in the thread uh, of these live live streams if anyone has any questions on ripple um Check out uh, Connect with Dixie or check out WRIPPLE dot com. Since we're on um, Web three, an example. So if AT and T were going to I don't know pivot and launch uh, an NFT collection or a Web three project or some kind of emerging tech adventure, they could use Ripple to like airdrop some talent onto the project in and out. That kind of thing. Ooh, interesting. That's an interesting analogy. Yeah, it's it's kind of one of those things that you get brought in for a specific purpose of specific scope, right? Uh, and that scope can turn into bigger internal capabilities uh, over time. So um, awesome. Well, thanks, uh, Ray Dixie at Ripple. Check them out. Um, 
So we have a really interesting guest today. Uh, again, the way guests come to us uh, come from you know us chasing them down, uh, begging and pleading, and to also some of our friends introducing us to, to people that we've never met before that we end up striking amazing uh, conversations and relationships with. So our guest today uh, has a really interesting backstory, and we always like to get into backstories, uh, but he starts out from uh, the chiropractic world. And this started getting me thinking because, you know, rabbit holes are, uh, are how I find stuff, right? Whether I am talking to somebody and want to chase down and research something, or I'm reading a book that has something in it that sends me to another rabbit hole. Uh, I was a CrossFit coach for, for a lot of years. And I, in my really? in curiosity to understand how the human body works, I started thinking about muscles. I started thinking about uh, bones. I started thinking about fascia, which is this weird, strange framework of ligaments and tendons and all of that stuff that kind of holds us together and allows us to do what we do. So thankfully, one of the other coaches was a chiropractor and he got me into like two or three books. I started figuring out what things like tensegrity is. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this before, but it's it's kind of um, uh, compression and tension working together to make something happen, which is like us standing upright. We're under both compression and tension. So anyway, not to go into super... <laughs> nerd world there but this is I, I you're telling us now that you that sorry you about were, that you're, you were a crossfit coach you're you're a man of many talents can we can we airdrop you into a some kind of a situation where you need a crossfit coach it's amazing 100 100 happy to help um but anyway in to tee up our guest and you know without further ado i want to i want to want to bring him on but this is just an idea of how a first principles approach can be applied to many things, right? Even if you don't have this, this discipline in web three that, you know, is a 20 year history, web three and emerging tech is kind of a confluence of disciplines coming together and understanding something like how the body works and structure and all of that can be applied to a lot of other things. So anyway, without further ado, uh, let's bring on our guest, Mark. Why don't you, why don't you intro intro? Yeah, so thanks to uh, James Tarling, who recommended our guest, um, Dr. Ankur Patak. Um, we all like an origin story, don't we? Um, Marvel make whole films of origin stories. And I think that Ankur has one of the most interesting that Jeremy has alluded to. Um, but he, so how do you go from a chiropractor to a principal at London Real Inventure, Ventures investing in AI, blockchain, and metaverse? Let's find out. Welcome. Dr. Pathak, what's happening? Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure being here, guys. Uh, thanks to James for introducing us. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure. Yeah, for sure. So Dr. Pathak joins us from Toronto um, and we, we appreciate him being here. Why don't you give us, give us a, little, a little bit about your background to kind of start us off and then we'll dive into how all of it interconnects in, in fun and interesting ways. Sure. Yeah. Look, I spent about 15 plus years doing chiropractor, uh, chiropractic, I should say, and also acupuncture at the same time. I was an acupuncturist uh, along with that. Uh, and I know it sounds funny, right? With that kind of background, how how in the world can you get into investing and Web3? And they're on two, two opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, and so, look, for me, uh, we can dive in deeper on how that happened. But uh, look, at the end of the day, it comes down to taking control of your own finances. That, that's what kind of led me down this path. Uh, and, and once you realize that nobody's coming to save you, uh, no one's going to take care of your money like you are going to do that, uh, then the responsibility is to learn everything about it. And funny enough, being in Web3, being in crypto has actually taught me more about money than anything else in the entire world. Uh, and so you mentioned at the top that you like to go down rabbit holes. There is no better rabbit hole as a, as, as a, as a global industry than Web3. Uh, and so going down those holes led me to this path of where I am today, where I am now investing in early stage projects, but also I've got a mind for my own finances and cryptocurrency will play a major part in that. So, so just a, a curiosity to, to understand the, the financial realm and how it affects your, your longevity, personal success, all of that good stuff. Like from a, so we talked about this last week. So from a from a cryptocurrency perspective from a digital currency perspective why are why do you think people are so baffled by it given the fact that the dollar is essentially just ones and zeros represented on a larger network 
Yeah, uh, to, to your point, uh, the, the one of the, the most common reasons for people saying I don't want to touch crypto is there's no inherent value. And my response is, well, if you take out your dollar bill and you put it on the table, what inherent value does it have? It doesn't have any. It's the market decides. It's the people decide that there is value to it. So, look, at the end of the day, a lot of times, a lot of times we depend on experts, those in the financial world to give us that confidence and leeway to say we should try this particular product or this industry. But the incumbents in place right now, they're comfortable. This is what they've known. This is what they've trained. And you cannot expect someone who's been doing this for 40, 50 years to all of a sudden say, you know what, let's shift in an entirely different direction that takes money out of my pocket uh, and that is actually going to favor you. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of that where we watch the news and we want experts to give us the OK to go do something. And until we get that, there's a very big barrier uh, before anyone does that. So that's the hardest part to kind of get over. Okay. Can I, on that? So imagine, so my dad will be watching this. Hi, dad. Um, Hi, Mark's dad. Very reluctant to, to even almost entertain the idea of Bitcoin and crypto. So what was it that drove you specifically a few years ago to, to go down that rabbit hole? And how would you address people like my dad who are, reticent to go down that rabbit hole themselves of crypto how would you convince them except for that inherent value um, yeah so so maybe i'll start with a convincing so I, I don't try to convince anyone anymore uh i started that way you know when you're new to something you you want to push it to everybody and you think you're you don't know what you're missing and, and i'm going to shove it down your throat and that's a wrong approach right uh at least it was for me because all you're going to do is you're going to make someone defensive for their current way of thinking uh, and it's not going to open up to anything new, right? So I, I don't try and convince anybody at all anymore. I say, look, these are the inherent values that I'm looking for. I'm looking for a way to control my financial destiny. I'm trying to create generational wealth. You can invest in the stock market. You need money to make money. If you want to invest in real estate, you need money to make money. And they also tell you at the same time that, you know what, wait 20, 30, 40 years and you're going to live a great life. I may not be around for that time period, right? So if I want to make wealth and I want to have control over it, the only way that I see that those two ideas marry each other is through cryptocurrency, Web3 as a whole, right? Yes, it's very volatile, but volatility is where the opportunity is. And so if we have that opportunity now, I'll, I'll say this. This is probably the only time in the history of the world where retailers, people like you and I, are ahead of institutions. Usually it's the other way around. They feed us what they think we want but they actually benefit on the back end. Here, we get to benefit first and then they come aboard and we benefit even more. So, so I guess that's how I would start just talking to anybody saying, look, it's not something you need to jump in tomorrow or today. I think you should, but the main thing is you have to be comfortable with whatever decision you make. And the best thing is, is to actually just start doing a little bit of research on your own. Don't rely on the headlines. Don't rely on you know your financial advisor because they don't want you to leave them absolutely not so they're not going to say yes go ahead and do it uh so there's all these things that i think we end up butting heads for no reason uh when at the end of the day if you can frame it that look it's about financial freedom it's about having choices and options and actual ownership of assets i think it's a better conversation to have thinking thinking about like the human side of, of all of this stuff you know even <clears throat> not just not just crypto but anything that's new and different from an existing system I think it's really interesting that that, that we as humans um, are generally risk averse, and we look for um, signaling from other folks, whether they be trusted friends, experts, or whatever it is, to 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 figure that out. And I think there's something interesting at play where um, a lot of us want to have this have this third party that is responsible for a bad decision versus trying to figure out on your own if the decision is valid or not. What do you what do you think about that idea? 100%. I'll also even go another step further. And I'll say that most of us who are trained in our careers, as you said before, no one's born with Web3. They're not taught Web3 in school. We figured that only if you've gone to school for certain things, can you be knowledgeable enough to actually execute. So for example, healthcare. Most of the people I know in healthcare, they're like, we do what we do well in healthcare, but when it comes to finances, we give that off to somebody else because they've gone to school and they've trained. And, and I think that's a faulty mentality because at the end of the day, whoever you give your money to 
it's their job. Just like your job is your job and how you view it at a certain point in time, right? They're putting food on their table. Nothing wrong with that, but they're not going to take care of your money. They don't have you in mind. You are one of many where your money is just yours. You're not managing anybody else's. So there's definitely that. I think it's more around the training aspect. You think you need to be an expert before you can do something. And now the narrative for me has flipped where I need to do something to become an expert. And so that's as how I you, go down those wormholes. As you've demonstrated. Yeah, yeah. And and look, it sucks. It, it sucks being an expert in one field and all of a sudden now you have to be a rookie. You're at the bottom of the rung. You don't know anything. And it's hard, right? I mean, well, I'm not 19 years old, 20 years old where, uh, you know, you're just able to absorb things as fast or have that stamina. But when it's important enough, uh, and, and there's something exciting within what you're doing, like you'll learn. And we live in an information world now. There, there's no reason you can't get access to any type of information. Jeremy is, and we're both big on transferable skills. So w what transferable skills, what did you take from your medical background? What do you think helped you to succeed so Kind of quickly, I, I, I don't say it's an overnight success, but the, the window is relatively small, I think, like three, four years. So, yeah, yeah, actually, great question. Because, because here's we talk about barriers all the time. And one of the biggest barriers is you think that, well, if I leave my current job or current industry, everything that I've gained, all the skills that I've gained now don't mean anything going into Web3. There couldn't be a bigger lie, right? So, for me, for example, dealing with patients. Uh, Look, it doesn't matter what you do in this world. There's always a human to human element to it. Decisions are made at a human level, interacting with people. So now I'm in the investing space. I deal with startups and I deal with investors. They're all human beings. So the ability to interact with different sorts of people from all over the world with different uh, backgrounds and different current histories, you know, that that was the skill that really helped me from from my chiropractic days. Uh, and so I would say, look, being professional. So Web3, obviously, as it started out, was very young, very tech heavy. You know, you had to be a nerd uh, or you were in your 20s and you're just tinkering around. What ended up happening was is that a lot of that professionalism wasn't there, right? Just some of the things that we kind of take for granted as we, you know, climb our way up in our industries, uh, you know, responding to emails correctly or on time, showing up to places. You know, there's just a demeanor about being a professional that was was lacking in the beginning days, right? And so... Lots of things that, man, I, I can't, anytime anybody tells me that I can't go into Web3 because of the skills that I've gained here don't translate, it's, it's the biggest lie in the world. It doesn't matter what industry you've been in before, there will always be transferable skills, always. And, it, and the biggest challenge too is, <clears throat> you know, that, that there's an emergence of, of people that are starting to think like that, that are, are wanting to become multi-threaded in the world that, in the machine that represents and fits single threaded entities, right? You know, specialization has been happening since the 1800s. You know, the school system was largely built on specialization. I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole, but I think the the key is being being able to tell a a concise story as to how your multi threaded experiences can be reapplied is is kind of the the power if you can figure that out. I mean, I tell that from my own experience because you know, people always ask me like, okay, you're, you're a music producer. What do you know about implementing, you know, storage technology in a data center? I'm like, well, I ran a data center consulting practice for eight years. That's why, you know, and, and here are the threads and spending time in these different worlds, but, you know, telling the story, this goes back to writing, telling the story is how other humans can relate to your multi-threadedness, right? Listen, that right there, you just hit the, hit the nail on the head for every single piece about doing anything in life. It's storytelling, right? Uh, and this is something that I, I stress to founders and even investors who are pitching their own funds. It doesn't matter about the technicalities. It doesn't matter about all the things that you think are important. If you can't weave a story that is clear, concise, and easy for someone to digest, it's not going to work, right? And so whether it's Web3, whether it's AI, it doesn't matter what space you want to go into, if you don't have a story that someone can then relate to somebody else, I think that's a missing piece, right? We think when I, well, if I talk to Jeremy, if I talk to Mark, it's just gonna stay with you, but you're probably gonna go and speak to somebody else about a conversation that we had. If you can't relate my story, 
I, I lost you, right? And so I think that's what happens in Web3, especially is too much focus, too much attention around tech uh, and what's so amazing under the hood and not enough around the storytelling as to why that's being created or why you got into it in the first place. So yeah, to your point, I think if there's any one skill that we should all learn and I'm improving on as well, is storytelling. Is storytelling Trump product? Storytelling should definitely gain your attention and then the product should close the deal, right? Uh, a lot of, in the hype cycle, it was only storylines, no product. Uh, but then also when you get, where you become invisible is when your product with no storyline, right? So I always say it's, it's not the best product that wins, it's the best known product that wins. So if you can't get your story out and people don't know why they should actually use your product, it's not going to work, right? And at the same time, if all you build is hype and people want to use it and have nothing to use, you also lost them too. So it's a fine balance. Uh, so I'm going to assume there's always a product. There has to be a product in some form or fashion, but the storytelling is really lacking. Well, good, great products usually have great experiences, right? When people interact with them. And those experiences are usually developed through a meticulously mapped out journey for the product user, right? It's like UX design, UI design are all informed by journey maps. Journeys are stories, right? So what is the story applied through the journey and the use of the product? And how does that connect to the product's uh, story as well? Like um, just a different way to a different way to apply it. So let me ask you this. So London Real Ventures, um, very interesting organization, media company, um, investment company, um, you're heading up uh, Web3 investments for them, right? Or all investments? Yeah, I mean, we do AI blockchain and metaverse, so all of them, yeah. Got it. So you you probably are, are seeing a lot of stories or a lot of lack there of lack stories. There, yes. So is, is that a big, is that a big, is that a big issue? And like, what percentage of, of pitches would you say are missing the story component? Just high level. Oh man, 90% uh, plus. It's that, so kind of like that follows on my question is like, what is at the moment in 2023, what is a good pitch? But perhaps the better question is, what is a bad pitch? What What are you seeing over and over again that is just bad? Except for that lack of storytelling. Is there anything else that we can add to it? Yeah, look, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, if you don't engage the investor somehow in a Q&A, you're one of maybe 40 or 50 that that investor has seen in that day, right? And you got to find ways to separate yourself. And, and, and where founders have a difficulty is seeing outside of their own product. They think what they're doing is, 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 is a unique idea that nobody has ever thought of. The investor may have seen 10 just like yours. You don't have that perspective, they do, right? And so what founders do, and here's a bigger problem I'll say, and, and I'll mention that afterwards. But during the pitch, it's all about the product. It's all about the them. They don't know who they're speaking to. They don't know how to engage the investor. They don't know how to make it a conversation. Now, there are certain situations where they say you have five minutes. That's all you got. Okay. I mean, you have to do what you have to do there, right? But there's the, the, the point of that most founders miss is that you're not going to get a check in one call or one pitch. The goal should be to get interest for another call. That's it. Right. So don't try and stuff every stat, everything you possibly can down their throat because they're just going to tune out. Right. And once you lose an investor, they're not coming back. And, you know, if they lose, if you lose them in the first five minutes, they're, they're not coming on minute 15 and, and re-engage. Right. So the point is, is how do you make it interesting to have another call or to have a follow up? That should be the goal. And I think that point is missing. What I mentioned about being the biggest problem is they don't do the work beforehand. You got to know who you're speaking to. Not every investor cares about the same thing. Some may only look at a return on their investment as all they want. Some might want media exposure. Some want my partnerships. Some, you know, like at the end of the day, every investor has a different agenda and a different motive. If you don't know what that is, you might be giving them something that they don't even care about, right? So, do you know if they've invested in your type of companies? Are you are you pitching to someone who has a competitor of yours in their portfolio company? you're never going to get an investment, right? So a lot of it is that. And then also on top of that, I'll say relationship building. Too many founders only rely on fundraising as a means to make relationships. And they're not doing it in the times when they don't need money. And if you can build relationships, 
the pitch is a breeze. People aren't even listening to you. They're just like, I love Jeremy. I love Mark. Here's my money. That's it. Right. But you can't do that unless you've built a relationship. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Trying to get it all done in the five minutes that you potentially have with somebody is, is, is not the right way. Cause it, it, it comes across uh, too urgent, disingenuous and, you know, lack of long-term thinking, right. And, and wanting to establish that long-term relationship um, with, with web three and emerging tech specifically, what sort of thesis do you guys have and how much, uh, how much, in, how much experimenting are you letting your founder partners do to try and achieve that thesis? Yeah. So, so for us, look, our biggest thing is we're looking at the team right we're very active in this market but we're also very picky right and, and reason being is we attach our brand directly to the product we have our ceos come on the platform they get a two and a half hour interview with brian uh himself and then that gets distributed across all of our social media channels and then and there as well so we're we're ingrained in this project we're a team uh, whereas other vcs they may have a portfolio of 100 companies 98 of them will fail and they don't really care because the two really did well right um, so for us team is extremely important for us quality of the project that we think is going to be there for 10 plus years we're not looking 10 months we're not looking a year out uh, we've got a long-term investment horizon so look we're geography agnostic we're protocol agnostic we're, we're vertical agnostic we, we're just looking for quality teams doing quality things with a long-term vision that's our overarching thesis so um a lot of the things that I think we all find compelling in 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 Web three is the idea of you know decentralization and and create, giving power to you know smaller founders or micro communities to establish this connection with their community that we talk about it a lot at, from a bi directional value exchange perspective where the community can feed the company, the company that can feed the community. And there is really tangible remuneration on, on both sides. I haven't really seen it fully in action. Like in my mind, it sounds like a really cool thing to have happen. There are a lot of experiments happening uh, in that, but you know, how, how much of that are you seeing come into play with, with some of these companies, the ones you invested in and the ones you're hearing about? Yeah. Look, uh, community. I mean, that's the, the whole core of web three. Right, generating a community that's going to support a project and want to see it continue forward, uh, and actually actively engage with that project is is the basis behind every project that's going to do well in Web three. In terms of remuneration, yeah, you know, it's always difficult because what ends up happening is a lot of projects want to build that community quickly, and so they try and get financial incentives to do so. Now you're attracting a different type of community that's only looking for the incentives, and once you stop those or reduce those, they leave and your project fails. Right. So this, again, goes back to storyline. If you can create a story where you're gathering people who want to see your project do well, whether they get financially incentivized or not, that's the key. And then you have a mind to actually generate uh, benefits for your community in the process. That's organic and that's great to do. And yes, of course, like if you are a financial product, if you are a DeFi product, you're, you know, you're built around returns and you need money from the community and then you can give, give those back. Yeah, that's, that's fine. But when too much of the emphasis is about financial rewards, it becomes problematic for the community. For sure. Um, speaking of the community, community, what obviously Jeremy and I have picked up on London Real Ventures is the, 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 the billion views and the, the YouTube exposure. And I like your, your headline, like our network, your effect. So what are you doing differently to other investment firms? How is the the media part of it built and operated and work? Yeah, look, we're, we're, we're turning this whole VC game on its head, right? Many of the VCs now you will see that are they're trying to build out a media outlet in some form, whether it's prog, you know, podcast, broadcast, it's an attention economy, right? We've built a 12 year moat that's been there, right? And we've built a community that cares about who we bring on the platform. So the biggest challenge that founders have, and I know many people think capital is always the biggest problem. It's actually not, especially when the bull run comes and everyone's just throwing money everywhere. They're not worried about money, they're worried about attention. And a lot of their two thirds of their fundraising is going to poor marketing, 
whether it's agencies bleeding them dry or it's influencers or KOLs who post something, take a bunch of money and they're off to the next project. So what we do is by having them on the platform, uh, and, and here's another thing is a lot of platforms are actually charging the, the founders to come on there. So essentially they get an investment for free into that project. Like we're not doing that. We're saying, look, we're going to invest in you like any investor would, but our value add is going to be the attention part that you need uh, and that you can't get easily anywhere else. And so that platform that we give them, like, I think one of the biggest things goes back to what we're talking about. It's always about the product. You never hear the backstory. You never hear the storyline as to how this came about. Why did you build it? What were your pain points that made you want to create this project in the first place? With our platform, with two and a half hours of an interview, we get through everything. You know, we get we get deep into the founder, the team, and why the entire entity was started in the first place. That's what audiences want to hear about, especially Web2 audiences. They don't want to hear, I use this protocol, and this is your APY, and this is the state. No, nobody cares, right? They want to know why is this useful, and what can I get out of this, and how should I support you if you've got a good story? And so with our platform, having a broader audience, it's not Web3 only, we get a lot more eyeballs and a lot more people caring about their project that could help them scale in the future. It's and it's it's a very interesting model for sure. And in you know having Web three founders come into this audience that you've established over the last you know you said twelve years. We were we were talking earlier, and we wanted to get some nuggets on how to grow thinking on paper to um, you know a billion uh, views and you know however many million subscribers and all that. And and the answer was quick. It was twelve years of of putting out great stuff. So Mark, uh, giddy up. 11, 11 and a half years to go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No, but it's interesting. Some of your guests, like, you know, Peter Diamandis, Robert Kiyosaki, Stephen Kotler, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, like really interesting guests. And I wonder like how, uh, it sounds like your audience is at least open to this new technology story, right? But they don't necessarily come from that world and do that so did you say neil degrasse tyson i didn't see this what was he was he coming on as just a, an, inf an informed guest or was he was he trying to get a product to market yeah just just guess for the most part he was a guest yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just guess look um and, and sorry your question was so so my question was this 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 audience that you've established is 12 years old it's tried and true they're trusting you uh, and you're delivering great guests, like like I said, Peter Diamand Diamandis, Neil deGrasse Tyson, very interesting topics. Um, how open are they to this this new tech, this Web3? Because a lot of the general population um, looks at the first version of what happened with Web3, hype, FOMO, all of that kind of stuff. How are they digesting some of this, some of this new and new and crazy stuff? Yeah, look, I mean, it's always easier in a bull market. Right. Uh, people always want to hear about the, the next person who made three hundred million dollars off of Dogecoin. Right. It's always interesting. And they don't want to hear how that person lost four hundred million in the process. Right. Uh, so so there is part of that. But I'll, I'll say this. Brian, the host and founder of London Real, his whole MO is just translating information to people who don't have access to that type of info. Right. So it's not necessarily it's this is something trendy and that's where we're going to get eyeballs. It's you know, we're trying to transform lives. And, and a lot of that, whether you like it or not, is from a financial means, right? If you've got if you've got the finances, you've got options. It's not about getting the yacht. You have the option to get one if you want one. Uh, but it's there that you can do what you want when you want. And so for us, they, 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 the audience really trusts in the guests coming in to provide value to them, whether they recognize it right away. And, and maybe, maybe I'll touch on even a little transition to how I got into here was actually through some of Brian's guests. One in particular, he came on and his name was Tika Tor. He came on in 2018, 19, and I never pulled the trigger to get into Web3. He then happened to come on in 2020 when I was now open to the whole finance game and everything like that. And I'm like, there's gotta be something here. Let me dive in. So the guests that do come on, they may come on at a time when you're not ready for that information, but then they come on again. And so, Really, the whole point is to get information out into the world for when people are ready to accept it or do something about it. It's there for them. And we just try and cycle through that information as much as possible. There's a real there's a real thread to tell them and tell them again and tell them again. There's I always bring up the story of Sherwood Schwartz 
and uh, Gilligan's Island and the theme song, when they first presented that, they're like, you're telling the whole story of the show again and again, people are going to get sick of it. And it's like, no, they, that's the formula. They relate to the formula. And when they watch the show, they're like, oh, this is comfortable. Here's the formula. Here's what's going on. Right. So it takes a lot of time to do that. Absolutely. And look, if you resonate with one guest or a few guests, and then there's more weight given to the next guest that comes on. So maybe you don't resonate with the message right then and there, but you're like, there's gotta be something here. If this person is on this platform, I trust this platform. Uh, maybe I should look into it. You know what I mean? So it just, like you said, it's, it's just planting seeds, right? You're planting seeds. And then when that individual is ready to do something, we're ready to do it. And, and I'll say this, one of the biggest things that we always talk about is web three really needs a village in order to spread the message. Right. So Brian has his platform. There are many other platforms who do it. You never know when your interpretation of something is going to make it click for somebody else. Right. Great. So, yeah, may, maybe the popular sentiment is, oh, Web3 is just all hype. But there might be 10, 15, one person in there who hears that message and their life completely changes. And now they go on to spread the message in their own way, which then unlocks for other people. So for us, like I said, 12 years in the making, it's about longevity. It's about putting out quality content for the audience to consume and then hopefully transform their lives when they are ready to make that change. Web3 for the, for the general population has to a greater or lesser extent, I think been replaced by AI for the general population. And I know that you kind of have that the trifecta of your investing is Web3 AI and the metaverse how much is now just AI? How many people coming to you are have a, an AI product or are weaving AI into their product? All of them? Yeah, look, I mean, the amount of projects that come in that says we're an AI project, but they're just an API to chat GPT. Uh, we're we're, 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 we're uh, quite, quite a few. Let's put it that way. Quite, quite a few. So it's always difficult to assess that. Uh, but look, I mean, there are projects that have been building in AI for decades before the hype. Right. Uh, Web3 is also something that's been built on decades of technology and research. Uh, so they don't necessarily have to go together. Uh, but the most explosive project is going to be one that can incorporate AI and blockchain together. Right. So what we look for is, well, first of all, when you know projects will say we have an AI play or a blockchain space play down the road. Uh, that's kind of a red flag. That just means you don't know what you're doing, but you're just kind of throwing that out there. So maybe you'll hook me in, right? Uh, and then also, when did you start the project, right? So many of the AI projects, they've been started since 2017, 18. So you know they were pre this current hype. Uh, so it's a good indication that, look, they're still building. They were building when no one cared about them. And now they're getting some shine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so that's kind of what we look for. When did you build it? And do you actually have something there? Or are you just kind of using that as a hook to bait us in? What are some other good red flags for for those that are that are budding uh, entrepreneurs and and pitchers? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there's so many red flags. Uh, look, at the end of the day, I try and give people the benefit of the doubt. It's the due diligence at the end, because look, honestly, you can have you can have jaded experiences and you bring that to the next pitch, and now you paint that founder with the same brush, and that's not correct, right? So a lot of it comes in the due diligence. A lot of it comes in, well, do you actually have a product, right? A lot of the, a lot of the raises are valuations were billions of dollars, hundreds of millions. And there was, it was written on a napkin, the idea, right? So do you have a product? Is there a business model there? Like, are you going to be free forever? And you're just going to pay KOLs and influencers to get users, but you, there's no way for you to make any money. Uh, so that, that has kind of shifted now. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a red flag, but you know, have you done anything in the space before or in a startup position before? I, I, I don't use that as a red flag because at some point everybody has to start, right? So if you're a first time founder, that shouldn't be a, a strike against you. Uh, it's, there's just more hesitancy and now maybe some more due deal that needs to be done. So yeah, at the end of the day, not having a product uh, and being all hype and saying you have a lot of investors, I'll tell you one, I'll tell you one right now, that's become more of a red flag now is people are lumping in technical backers, people that they have partnerships with as those that are investors in them. So they kind of lump everybody together, right? So they might say, oh, we're backed by NVIDIA. Well, no, you're not. You have a partnership with NVIDIA to use technology. They didn't invest in you. 
So when I hear that kind of stuff, I'm like, well, if you're stretching the truth here on this to get my attention, what else is happening in here that I kind of need to look at? That's a good, that's a good one. That's a good one. And, you know, founders are, you know, there's such a, it's gotta be, it's gotta be this, this challenge where they have this like three minutes, right? Sometimes they get three minutes and they're like, man, they move into land of disingenuous to try and spark that three minutes, but it's so it's quick. I mean, it's quick to be able to spot that kind of stuff. Um, and it, and it, and it's good to be able to unpack it as well. Um, so, so we talked about the red flags. What about what, give me, uh, so uh, the last like 30 pitches you've heard, hmm. give me, give me one that's like, and we don't have to say company name or anything like that if we need to hold that tight, but give me one that like blew your mind and why your mind was blown. Ooh, uh, you know what? There's different, there's different reasons for blowing my mind. Um, I will say that a lot of emphasis now put on who else is on, who else is backing you legitimately. You know, so so is Anna Mocha uh, behind you, you know, um, you know, New Tribe Capital, whoever it may be. Are the, are the tier ones, the Andreessen's or Sequoia's, are these guys behind you? Uh, and I'll tell you a little wrinkle in there was when people say that they've received an investment. It's usually a grant. And so a grant is not an investment. Right. And so that's another little bit of a play that they're doing. Uh, so, like, yeah, look, I can be wowed by, oh, my God, why are all these tier one entities investing in you guys? So now, now I'm a little bit wild on that angle. Technology is another thing. If you can show me a demo, that's way better than just reading through your, your pitch, right? So I still like a little bit of a pitch, like throw some slides in there, maybe a couple, and then move on to a demo. Uh, so what, I've seen some technology lately that has blown my mind. So I, I've been kind of floored by that. That gets me excited. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the team, if I can look at your history and you said you've had 19 exits and you've done all these different things, um, that can wow me as well. If you put all those three together, well, now we got something, right? So, so that's kind of what I look at. Nice you mentioned Animoca. So gaming is obviously a big part of it. Um, it's a, being, I just want to be wary of time. Um, if I could just change the the, the flow a little bit. I, I know that people will be interested in what's coming next. And I obviously, fingers crossed, there's the, the Bitcoin ETFs are going to be given the green light sooner rather than later. Ethereum ETFs in America, the inevitable bull run that you mentioned. How are you? So we started this conversation talking about personal finance and controlling our own assets. How are you personally preparing or going to prepare for the next bull run? And professionally, how are you going to, or how are you preparing for that? Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting because now I'm in a position where professional and personal are kind of being merged together, right? Uh, I think everyone should have some exposure to early investments. In this market, when everyone is so scared, this is the time. This is the time to be at least learning, if not investing, uh, some money, right? And I think one of the biggest things that people think is that it's like a share in the stock market. If there's Bitcoin, I have to buy one Bitcoin or I have to buy one ETH. That's not the case at all. You can buy $50 worth, $100 worth, $10, like whatever you have that you are okay to invest, you can invest and get a piece of it, right? So I, I want to make sure that's clear for, for your audience as well. Like you don't need one of anything. Right. If you can, great. Uh, but you can just put in a little bit and see how it performs and then add to it as you want to. Right. For me, you know, I'm investing in Bitcoin and ETH uh, and a couple other uh, coins as well. But a lot of my attention now is obviously in these projects. Right. Valuations are really low. I know anyone who's building at this time is usually trying to build for the long term because there's no money for them to get thrown at them. Right. They're not trying to get money and run. There's none to be had. So that's where i'm positioned as early investing and and i think again web3 is such a great place that you can get involved with early stage web3 projects like you can never do with a web2 project right like we all met on linkedin those web3 projects are on linkedin if you make it known that you're willing to be a part of their journey you can get involved with an early stage web3 company so i would i would highly recommend for for people to get exposure to early stage investments that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, because even if Bitcoin goes to 100,000, that's what three x its money, three uh, x its position right now. If you get an early stage project, it could end up being a hundred x return or a thousand x return. 
right? I mean, you look at Peter Thiel and Facebook. That was like a 2300x return that he got, right, uh, with his investment. So, and, and, and those opportunities were never available to the regular public. Like no one was calling me to say, do you want to invest in Facebook at that time, right? Web3 is completely different. It's open. So and going back to that, how my position, I'm positioned, yes, in some currencies, but now more of the focus is actually on early stage investing. Not financial advice, Jeremy, from thinking on paper. Not financial advice. Facts, 100%. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Well, this has been great. I, you know, again, definitely want to be mindful of time. We're, we're coming towards the, towards the end of this piece. Um, I, it's been a fascinating conversation. I think, I think what, what we've learned in this is, you know, the, the idea of multi-threaded is starting to become a little bit more um, acceptable than single threaded. Just in general, we've learned that building a trusted community over 12 years takes per perseverance, takes grit, consistency, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. And then being able to leverage that in a very interesting way to create opportunity for new startups, I think is is flipping the model a little bit. Um, so I, it's been fascinating, Ancor, listening and, and, and learning more about this stuff. Where can people find out a little bit more about uh, London Real and what you're doing uh, in the future? Yeah, I mean, we've got the London Real Ventures website. We've got London Real website as well. Obviously, YouTube, uh, London Real has that. London Real also has their own platform, LondonReal.tv. Uh, for myself, LinkedIn uh, is a great place to find me, just like I found you guys. Uh, so so all across the board. I just want to say one thing for your audience, though. And I always, always want to stress this for people. The best education is action. You, you can listen to as many podcasts as you want, watch as many videos. If you don't put some skin in the game, it could be $10, $15, whatever it is, you will never actually learn anything, right? So stop listening to people who are saying crypto is the greatest thing and stop listening to people saying crypto is the worst thing. Actually play in this space and make your own decision. That's a great, it's a great point. And I think, it, and I've learned some lessons too, but I've, I've chalked those lessons up to, you know, education, right? You know, making it, you know, you spend a hundred bucks going to a concert, you spend a hundred bucks on a video game or whatever. You can spend a hundred bucks, you know, diving into some sort of, you know, web three experience and then figuring out the good and the bad. You don't know until you get in there. You don't know what that user journey is going to look like. You don't know what that community is going to look like. Um, so that's what I've been doing. I've, and I think Mark's been doing but that too, just like having fun with these little- and, and yeah. NFTs and DeFi from our perspective is is that. I mean, we now I think everybody has- you, you got to have skin in the game, don't you? you to, to understand something, to learn something, to, to get better, you skin in the game. And that's going to, as Anchor says, that's going to take you a lot further than listening to people with skin in the game telling you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, as a quick wrap up, uh, I had a, I had a thought back to our friends at, uh, at ripple with a W. So a lot of you entrepreneurs that are building companies that are building potential companies, startups, the whole nine, we've heard that 90% of you are lacking a, uh, a story, right? So uh, I would encourage some of you folks mm -hmm. to go to Ripple and find a writer. Yeah. I think there's a couple on there that I know yeah. that could help you develop that story. But yeah, we want to thank Ripple again for all their great support. This could be an awesome opportunity for, for you entrepreneurs to go find a writer. www.ripple.com with a W. And also thinking on paper.xyz, you can find all of our episodes, a little more about Mark and myself. Uh, we're up on YouTube, we're up on Spotify. We're not quite to um, to 5 million subscribers yet, but we're getting close. So subscribe, to go to YouTube and subscribe. Hit it now, do it, do it. But um, Dr. Pathak, thanks so much for joining. It's been a great pleasure. And um, we'll do a wrap up, include some links and all that stuff. Keep up the great work. And hopefully we'll see you again. Well, thank see you. Thank you for having me on, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.